Hello, and welcome to the latest Expert Series webinar. Today's webinar is MinVol for the Long Haul. This is a complimentary Index Universe webinar, courtesy of BlackRock's iShares unit, as well as MSCI. I'm Ollie Ludwig, the Managing Editor of Index Universe, the public face of Index Universe LLC, the leading authority on news and data about ETFs, and the company behind Inside ETFs, the world's largest ETF conference. Joining me today are Raman Subramanian of MSCI and Todd Mathias of iShares. Todd is a product consultant at iShares in San Francisco charged with strategic product development. And Robin, Raman is an executive director of index applied research at MSCI. He is in charge of creating new index methodologies and improving existing methodologies. Todd will talk about the product mix that Black, BlackRock's iShares unit offers. And Ra Raman will get more deeply into the indexes behind the iShares lineup of low volatility funds. Before we get started, I'd like everyone to know that they can ask questions at any time during the webinar in the window at the lower right of your screens. Now, BlackRock's iShares unit is the biggest ETF company in the world, and its US listed ETF assets are now over $600 billion, or about 40% of the 1.5 trillion now invested in US listed ETFs, according to the numbers we compile every day. And MSCI is one of the biggest names in the world of indexing, equities in particular. Its annual country classification each year is one of those dates that indexing nerds like myself mark on their calendars well ahead of time. We are focusing on low volatility strategies. So we'll talk about the quartet of iShares low vol ETFs that came to market almost two years ago and that now have upwards of $7 billion in assets. Those include the iShares MSCI USA Minimum Volatility ETF. It trades under the symbol USMV. It has assets of about $2.5 billion. We'll also be talking about the iShares MSCI EFA Minimum Volatility ETF. It trades under the symbol EFAV, and it has about $750 million in assets. Additionally, we'll be talking about the iShares MSCI All Country World Minimum Volatility ETF. It trades under the symbol ACWV, has assets of about $1 billion. And finally, last but not least, the iShares MSCI Emerging Markets Minimum Volatility ETF. It's a riff on EEM, the huge iShares Developing Markets ETF. And this ETF also has about $2.5 billion in assets. Now, low volatility strategies began appearing in May 2011. And given the various bumps in the road since the collapse of Lehman Brothers in September 2008, including the flash crash, the Eurozone debt crisis, the US debt downgrade in 2011, as well as difficult negotiations over the fiscal future in the US involving the fiscal cliff and sequestration have made all these strategies quite popular. Still, not every fund sponsor in this segment has been successful. Notably, Russell Investments, whose ambitious foray into low vol and other factor-focused ETFs ended rather poorly with the shuttering of about 25 funds about a year ago. So what explains the success of the iShares and MSCI partnership? And how do these funds stack up against the competition? After all, $7 billion in AUM is nothing to scoff at. And all else being equal, these funds are viable and liquid as securities. So in the next hour, we're going to examine these questions and more. So let's get right into it with Raman Subramanian of MSCI. Raman? Thank you, Oli. Uh, welcome again to all of you for today's uh, webinar on uh, minimum volatility for long haul. Um, as Oli said, I work in MSCI uh, in the index applied research, uh, working with institutions and retail investors, explaining our benchmark methodologies. So before I jump into the, the actual index construction for MSCI minimum volatility indices, I'd, spend, I'd like to spend some time about explaining what exactly is uh, a minimum volatility or low volatility effect. Um, so if you look at the basic financial theory, uh, we have been all told that if you want to generate excess return or generate alpha, you probably are looking for stocks uh, with uh, with a higher risk or an asset class with a higher risk. So if you take higher risk, probably you're going to be potentially uh, provided with a higher return. 
But in reality, what has happened is that when you look at the performance of stocks which have uh, exhibited lower risk or lower uh, total risk, have outperformed the stocks with high risk in the long run. And, and, and that's not just a U.S. phenomena. It has acro happened across all the, all the different equity markets. And, and this is explained as, or this is called as a, a low volatility effect. Now, this uh, effect has been studied by academic, uh, academic uh, and, 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 and uh, many leading uh, researchers over the period of time and going back to 70s. Uh, in fact, Black and Jensen also talked about from the context of uh, uh, beta at the time. They said that stocks with higher beta have exhibited negative return compared to stocks with uh, low beta. So, so it's not a new phenomenon, and, and only in the recent times, uh, as institutions have been, uh, been facing higher volatility in the market, they have tried to uh, exploit this, this anomaly by, by looking at uh, investable portfolios, which will allow them to get ex exposure to low volatility uh, stocks and, uh, and, and, and similar portfolios. And, and some of the reasons which have been given by academic research on why why a low volatility effect persists is that if you look at the, it, it, there are two main basic facts. Uh, one is related to behavioral finance, where investors usually are looking for stocks with higher skewness or higher uh, payout, uh, like a lottery-like payout, and thereby they are looking for stocks which have exhibited higher volatility, volatility. And in that process, what they do is that they shy away from the stocks which have low volatility. And this results in a premium for the low volatility stocks. The other aspect which has been given from an institutional perspective is that most of the institutions use a, a sort of a benchmark to measure the performance uh, for the managers. And in the process, they put some sort of a constraint on tracking error, uh, which is linked to the, the, the active risk related to the, the underlying benchmark. In the process, what happens is the managers are forced to look for high volatility stocks in their holdings which again explains why uh, institutions shy away from low volatility stocks and which has resulted in an excess return for a, a low volatility basket. So the next question comes is that if low volatility uh, premia exist, how do you create an investable uh, portfolio or investable benchmark either to measure the performance of the managers who are trying to uh, exploit that anomaly or, or, or uh, the other way is that how do you actually create an investable portfolio which can be used, uh, utilized to create a passive tracking um, um, product uh, like an ETF. So let's let's look at how uh, what are the challenges in construction of a methodology, low portfolio methodology, uh, portfolio index methodology, and how MSCI has tried to address those uh, challenges in com coming with the MSCI minimum volatility index methodology. So there are two basic ways of constructing a, a low volatility portfolio index or a low or minimum volatility index. One is a very simple methodology, which you know you can rank uh, rank the index by volatility and pick up stocks which have exhibited lower volatility. So uh, you might know that um, S&P, in fact, uh, has a product on like that. Their, their index is they take the S&P 500, they sort it by. Uh, by volatility, and they took, uh, take the bottom uh, 100 stocks which have exhibited lower volatility. The other approach which MSCI uses is a little bit different from the, the, the rank order methodology. What we do is that instead of just simply ranking the stocks, uh, sorting the stock by volatility, we look at the, not only the volatility as a parameter, we also look at the, the variance, covariance of the stocks or the correlation between the stocks. And, and, and the reason for selecting uh, this particular aspect of the methodology was a simple rank order comes from the fact that when you, when you create a simple rank order methodology, it can potentially create unwanted biases. And, and, and those unwanted biases can be very exaggerated when you are talking about international global, uh, 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 when you're trying to take this methodology and apply that on a global uh, level. For example, if you, if you look at a, a simple rank order methodology and a, you apply that on a, on a country which, is, which typically has not traded for some, some amount of time, probably you're going to bias towards the country when you're creating country composite index. Well, you might all know that um, during the Arab uh, um, Spring, uh, in uh, Egypt, didn't, Egypt, Egyptian stocks didn't stay for a couple of two months. And if you have created a simple rank order methodology on a global level for emerging market stocks, most of the stocks would be you will be holding is Egyptian stocks, so that can create an issue because it is a, it's an anomaly which was there because the stock market didn't trade, 
to avoid those kind of situation, the way what we MSCI does is that we start with the parent index and we apply a, a, a process called optimization, which is nothing but you're trying to to come with a portfolio by selecting stocks which have exhibited not only lower volatility, but in, in reference they also have together provided a total risk and, and, in, and come to the final what is called the MSCI minimum volatility index. The constraints that we put are typically at the sector level, so you're not forcing a one particular sector to be biased. You know, the, if, you, if you go back to the rank order methodology, you find that you will be holding potentially a, uh, mostly utility or healthcare stocks, which typically have a low, a, always have shown a lower risk or lower volatility. You may also be uh, having uh, country bias, so we also put country level constraints, so we don't want to deviate too much away from the parent in the benchmark, but ultimately you are trying to get the, the, the parent level exposure, similar country exposure, and similar sector level exposure. So we put constraints on the country level, um, uh, um, uh, country weights also. We put some uh, constraint on the size. So, so what we do is that we don't want other anomalies to creep in, like, you know, value or small cap. We are trying to, to basically focus more on the lower volatility uh, stocks here. And finally, we put a very important constraint on turnover. Uh, and this is very important because if you, if you typically most of these minimum volatility strategies tend to have a, a typically a higher turnover, and if you don't put any constraint on turnover, it can it can re really create a, a portfolio which have a uh, although it may be investable, it can create a, a potentially higher turnover, uh, which can remove some of the potential alpha generation opportunities which may exist in these kind of uh, strategies. So with, with those constraints, what we, have, uh, what we do is that we start with the parent index and come with the min vol index. In natural, what's happening is that you are having an index which still reflects all the basic characteristics of the underlying benchmark, whether it's MSCI EFA, ACRI, uh, which is all country world, including developed and emerging market, or the U.S. index, and, um, and coming with, come to a portfolio which has exhibited lower risk. Uh, without avoiding, um, a, 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 without creating any significant bias at the country or sector level and maintaining the investability and replicability of the index, which is very suitable for product creation. And one one thing, the next question comes is that, okay, was it a recent thing which MSCI did or was this index existing for a long time? And what happened during the financial crisis? MSCI is the only index provider uh, which have a longer track record of this particular benchmark or in index. And we, we launched this index in May of 2008, um, uh, long before you know, uh, some of the other index providers launched this, these kind of similar strategies. And our index was the only live index which, which was there during the financial crisis of 2008 and much more recently during the, the euro crisis. So it, it has seen the two, two major crises um, in the last uh, five years. And, and it, it, the index characters behaved as expected. So it provided a better downside protection and exhibited lower risk compared to the, uh, the, the parent benchmark, where the, which is our starting universe for construction. So let's look at the, the risk characteristic and return characteristic of this benchmark. Um, so here on this uh, slide on the lower uh, right side, we show the performance, uh, the, the risk of the MSCI World Index, uh, which is the green line and uh, the MSCI minimum volatility is a blue line. This is a realized risk. So you can clearly see that over the last um, decade or so, the MSCI min vol index has always exhibited lower risk compared to the MSCI world index. So that is, that is the basic tenant. So we wanted to ca have a portfolio which have a low risk, but with similar uh, underlying characteristics of the benchmark. And we, we find that based upon the methodology, we have achieved that by having a lower risk compared to the, the, uh, the parent benchmark. And one interesting thing to note is that the ratio of the risk of the parent ben, uh, the min wall to the, the, the MSCI World Index, actually uh, you get a larger benefit when the risk goes up. So you can clearly see from 2008 to uh, 2011 when the risk of the market was going up, the, the ratio, basically, MSCI min wall index exhibited lower risk, which can also you can see here in the in the lower chart where we find that as the risk was going up in the uh, the main parent benchmark, the MSCI min wall index uh, exhibited lower risk compared to the parent benchmark, which which in turn gives you a better downside protection. Now, in terms of performance, um, it's a little bit interesting. So what what we have observed is that 
MSCI in the long uh, MSCI Minwall index, and we are showing here five years of performance, which is the mostly the li live index performance. But you can go back historically and go back last 20 plus years. But if you even focus on the last five years, you can clearly see that the MSCI Minwall index do under, uh, under uh, outperform mainly during when the, the the market crisis is going up, and 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 during the normal period. Uh, the index performance was quite similar to the underlying parent benchmark. So the excess return is usually generated during the main crisis period, and, and so we can clearly see during the subprime crisis or Eurozone crisis, the MSCI min wall index. So these are relative charts, so when the line is going up, the MSCI min wall index is outperformed related to parent benchmark, and, and when the line goes down, uh, the, the index, the min wall index, underperformed the MSCI world index in this case. So, so right after the, the you know, in February of '09, when the junk, uh, junk rally started, you can clearly see that the min wall index slightly started to underperform. But as the eurozone crisis again picked up in the summer of 2010, again the min wall index outperformed. So historically, what we have seen is that you know, strategically, investors who want to get the beta exposure and worried about the volatility of the index of the of the underlying you know uh, country or even um, or a composite index will prefer a min wall like an allocation uh, as a strategic core allocation and and sometime if if an investor is trying to exploit this um, in more a tactical basis they can also switch between a market cap weighted to a min wall strategies depending upon um, how the how the, the the expected risk which is coming up in the market and we can also clearly see that at least in the in the the period that uh, we are showing here, the MSCI Minwall World Index outperform um, the MSCI World Index by about 270 basis points or so, and with a real, lower realized risk, which results in a better sharp ratio or risk adjusted return for the MSCI Minwall Index. And let's move on to the next slide where we show what has happened historically across the different regions. And you can clearly see that this phenomena exists across all the markets. It's not just for the U.S. We can see that even for MSCI min, emerging market, the MSCI emerging market min wall outperform with a low risk. So this is another way of uh, investors who really want to go into emerging market or worried about the volatility which exists in emerging market can focus on a, a EM min wall like a strategy to get the beta exposure for emerging market but with a low risk. So to, co to conclude, from my side, um, MSCI is the only index provider who have a very uh, uh, live minimum volta index uh, index record starting from 2008, which has seen the two uh, the financial crisis and the eurozone crisis, and and in a nutshell, the robustness of the methodology is maintain um, a, a proven risk rec reduction record of at least 20 to 40 percent across various countries and regions. Um, Todd, over to you. Thank you. Uh, and I want to go ahead and thank Index Universe for hosting and being a great partner uh, in providing index information. I also want to thank MSCI for being a, a great partner and, and providing some, some color here on the index construction. And as mentioned, I'm Todd Mathias. I work here. I work as a product consultant here at BlackRock. Uh, really what I've been able to do is spend a disproportionate amount of my time supporting our Minval product set. Uh, this entails hundreds of client meetings, client calls, across the globe, inclusive of broad presentations, trainings, analysis um, that's on our products, but also on the competitive landscape. What I want to cover today is I want to piggyback on some of Raman's statements around the academic theory that MinVol is trying to harvest. I also want to talk about the products that BlackRock and iShares has launched in October of 2011. And then lastly, I want to talk about implementation. And as this is a critical benefit to our clients, and it's where we do get a significant amount of our questions. Um, over this period, I, I do want to weave in the, the questions I get from clients, the concerns I get from clients, and then tie in some real experiences. I think that that's what's going to differentiate this product from other products in the marketplace. Um, before we jump in and get started, um, I was most recently asked by a client around entry point. When would I want to buy this type of product? Well, I think it's, it's very different depending on the experience or the exposure that, that every investor is looking for, but I would be remiss not to mention some recent views from our chief investment strategist, speaking about September as one of the most volatile months for equity, uh, upcoming market anxiety around the taper from the Fed, and then potential increase of volatility within Europe uh, with upcoming German elections. And then lastly, a U.S. budget debate towards the end of September. 
how will all of this affect broader market volatility, and does this offer a good opportunity to enter a low or a min-vol product? These are all factors that investors face in terms of approaching equity, when to buy in, and what experience are you looking for? So go, before we go right into the, the products that we offer, uh, I think it's important for for investors to understand the academic theory that Raman touched on. I think that's a critical component of this as a long-term strategic investment on how you can provide equity exposure with significantly less risk but not necessarily give up return over longer periods of time. A component that Raman mentioned was behavioral, so it comes from behavioral finance, is are investors compensated for the amount of risk they take? Are markets efficient here? Um, Efficient markets are based on a number of components, some being there are no transaction costs, there are no taxes, and that we all make rational decisions. I think what Raman alluded to is that we don't always make rational decisions when it comes to investing. We tend to look at historical returns and extrapolate them out, saying that we're going to get those again and that we're going to be compensated fairly for the amount of risk that we take there. The second component that Raman mentioned was institutional constraints. So there tends to be constraints for many clients around only being able to have long-only investments and not use leverage, as well as tracking error. So you, you, you tie that into an active manager who's evaluated relative to the benchmark of choice. And for instance, let's say it's a, you know, a U.S. large cap manager that's benchmarked to the S&P 500, and they start evaluating underlying securities. And their goal is to beat the benchmark by 2%, so that's what they promise clients. They start evaluating securities, and they find, too, that they both, are, they both believe that these securities are equally valued or fairly valued. One has a beta of 0.6, and one has a beta of 1.2. Naturally, that portfolio manager is going to be incentivized to buy the stock that has a beta of 1.2. All that stock needs to do is meet its market expecta expectations to produce that 2% of alpha or that 2% of excess return. This is another component that creates this low beta anomaly where you can see that lower beta securities, when thoughtfully constructed in a portfolio, can provide lower risk but not necessarily give up return over a longer period of time. In October of 2011, we launched four minimum volatility products, all MSCI, MSCI benchmarked, consistent in the methodology that Raman described. We're fortunate to have gathered just around $7 billion in assets in that, let's call it, two-year period. Um, all of our products are attractively priced, sitting between 15 and 25 basis points. The reason we launched these products was strictly out of institutional demand. They were years in the making, but we had many clients across the globe looking for ways to access equity and looking for an investable way to harvest this low beta anomaly. They saw the benefits of this as a portfolio allocation tool. Um, many of these clients could license the index on their own, but they saw the value of an ETF as a vehicle to gain its exposure because of the liquidity component, because of the tax efficiency, and as well as because of the low cost that we, we can offer. Um, from here, I want to ask Raman a quick question from MSCI is, you know, in his opinion and when he's worked with institutional clients, what has attracted them to the MSCI minimum volatility index rather than going with another index provider that may be offering a similar type of strategy? Yeah, that's a great question. So if you look at, you know, what has happened in the last um, maybe a decade or so, many of the, uh, the plans, global pension plans, and even if you go from a retail perspective, uh, many of the people have moved away, investors have moved away from their country home buyers and moved more globally into international and uh, global markets. In that context, what, what has happened is that they all start from one underlying uh, global portfolio like a uh, all-country world or MSCI world index and then allocate to different countries based upon uh, the underlying benchmark. So, so in practice, what they're looking for is to make an allocation to, to the underlying benchmark and, and in the process, they are looking for a, a, uh, an allocation which can also provide them a lower risk. For example, if you are first time making moving to emerging market and, and you are worried about the excess volatility in emerging market and you're looking for a, a manager who can provide or a product that can provide a lower risk, potentially they are looking for a MSCI emerging market minimum volatility kind of strategy. So those is, that is one kind of approach. The other thing is that uh, we have seen 
pensions have started to de-risk their portfolios. Um, so one option is they can go to fixed income to de-risk, but then they will lose. Uh, they can potentially lose up any anything which are rebound in the market. So since the index methodology and 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 the way the indices are constructed, retain the basic characteristic of your underlying benchmark without without deviating too much on the countries and sectors and so on and so forth. You can still get the benefit or the beta benefit of okay, still maintaining the exposure to the countries, but with a lower risk. So those are the two main uh, aspect of of the many of the larger institutions that have moved into a min wall like strategy. Thanks, Raman. A uh, very similar thing that we've seen on our side from BlackRock is is folks who like investing and investors who who like the MSCI framework. They're attracted to it um, not only because of the robust methodology evaluating the standard deviations of those underlying securities as well as the correlations, very similar to how they would manage their portfolios, but also from the component of the, the constraints around sector and country, eliminating event risk or, or minimizing event risk when it comes to implementing these within portfolios. So they, they see them as a way that they access these broad markets, do it in a minimum volatility framework, but not necessarily take on event risk and retain the integrity of that broad market. When working with clients, they typically want to evaluate the minimum volatility solution similar to how they would evaluate an active manager. Uh, they think this because of it's, while it's an index, it's alternatively weighted. It's, it's different from a market cap weighted exposure. Uh, so they typically want to evaluate the up and down capture ratios. Uh, on this top chart, this is what we're showing is the up and down capture ratio since 2009. Uh, I think what, what's important here is that you're capturing a disproportionate amount of the upside than you are the downside. And what I've found from working with a number of clients is that this is how they discuss their process with their clients, is that they will provide upside participation, but when markets get tough, they're going to help protect their clients. Um, really, they're not going to knock the cover off the ball, but they will be there to protect and offer capital preservation when your clients need it the most. The next slide here is, is really just showing something that we, we see in a lot of um, financial presentations is the, the scatter plot. So where do we sit? Um, we're moving up to that northwest quadrant. Really, the goal of the minimum volatility solution over the longer period of time is to move to the left. But because we've been in such a volatile market, uh, you've seen outperformance from the minimum volatility indices and the minimum volatility solutions relative to the broad market, hence why we're moving up to the, the northwest area of that chart. So when I'm speaking with clients and we talk about the minimum volatility solutions, they want to know, well, how do I measure the effectiveness of performance or the effectiveness of this type of product within my, for my client or within my portfolio? If we're looking at the, the top left and we're looking at risk and we're looking at standard deviations here, you bought a product or you're investing relative to an index that has minimum volatility in the name. I think it's important over a longer period of time, did I provide a lower volatility solution than my opportunity cost? Opportunity cost here being the broad market of that same asset class. What I like about that top bar graph is the consistent delta, so the consistent difference between the emerging market minimum volatility index and then the broad-based emerging market index. Very consistent over these longer periods of time on an annualized basis. The next component where clients want to know is, well, did I provide greater return for the amount of risk I take? So that's the sharp ratio in the, in the bottom left. And again, the answer is yes over since inception of the index in 2009, as well as over the other periods. Um, Lastly, they understand that the sharp ratio doesn't necessarily get you to your goal of get you to your son's college tuition. Um, returns will get you there. So did I provide a similar return for less risk? And I think that you, you look at these returns, and the answer has been yes. You've actually had significant outperformance from the Emerging Markets Index over, these, over the one year, over the three year, and, and since inception. Um, clients typically then want to isolate periods and talk about when will this do best and when can I expect that I may lag in performance. As naturally as you, as you would anticipate, a time period like the late 90s, maybe 2003 to 2007, 2009, um, you have to anticipate if you take 25 to 40 percent of risk off the table that you are not going to have the same performance as the market or maybe even an active manager in the space. 
for instance, in 2009, emerging markets were up around 80%, and the MinVol solution was up about 60%. Um, clients are typically comfortable if they're up 60% just in one year's time. The other component is, do these offer downside protection? Um, since we're speaking about emerging markets, 2011 emerging markets were down around 18%, and the MinVol solution was only down around 6 So the answer is yes. In my research, and when I've looked at these products, these indices, and the academic theory and how they behave, you actually see greater performance and greater risk reduction in volatile time periods. And so if you take that emerging market for example, and you think about 2012, that was an extremely volatile time period for emerging markets. If we want to just isolate that 2012, I was getting many questions from clients across the globe. Why is your emerging markets product outperforming EEM, or in another case, why is it outperforming VWO? We have a double-digit year of performance, double-digit in equity markets. Um, you say you're providing a lower volatility solution. If you actually break that market apart and you look at the first three months, first three months, emerging markets were up around 18 or 19 percent, and the MinVol solution captured 75 percent of that upswing. The next three months, so from March to June, emerging markets were down about 18 or 19 percent, something very not. Uh, excuse me, it's, it's fairly common in, in volatile markets like emerging markets. So you're down that 19%, and the MinVol solution captured only 50%, 50% of that, and then stayed fairly neck and neck threat throughout the year, offering about 3% of outperformance in 2012 relative to the broad market. So I think what this gets us to is, is that up and down capture ratio. Um, by capturing a disproportionate amount of the upside while still providing protection on the downside, a byproduct of that is going to be compounding. So this allows that if we're in volatile markets, if we anticipate we're going to see volatility and we're going to see markets that oscillate, you have the ability to provide equal, if not better, performance with lower risk with this type of strategy. Moving in, into a U.S. markets, uh, another strong area for, for minimum volatility. Again, in that top left, you see that same delta um, consistently, really, with the one, three, five years. You see that increase in sharp ratio over the longer period of time. And then you see outperformance over longer periods of time as well, maybe not as significant as in emerging markets, but pretty, uh, pretty strong as we've seen clients use this as a core holding within or starting to use this as a core holding within their framework. Uh, very similar to that 2012 example, 2011, um, 2011 was an extremely volatile time period for U.S. markets, where the S&P 500 was up nearly 20 percent before going into the summer of 2011, where we had the sovereign debt crisis and the down downgrade of U.S. debt, really ending the year of 2011 only up about 2 percent in the S&P 500. So uh, that's a, a market I would view as oscillating. Uh, this is a flagship year for minimum volatility, where the U.S. MinVol index outperformed by 10 percent with a 39 percent reduction in risk. So you can see how valuable it is not just to protect clients on the downside, but if you believe markets are going to be volatile. This is an attractive area for this, this type of investment. So we're typically asked, well, should I be using this strategically or should I be using this, this tactically? Um, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. Uh, based on the academic theory, we would try to guide toward clients towards using this as a strategic investment, as timing volatility can be very difficult. Um, if I knew how to do it, I'd be in one of those corona commercials on the beach. Um, but I think in reality, you can see here is that when volatility picks up, that's when you get your, your greatest outperformance relative to the market. Now getting into implementation and, and how this really affects clients and they really start seeing the benefits. Here you have a, a fairly rudimentary example where you're taking a 40% fixed income, 60% equity portfolio, um, and just taking out those market exposures and supplementing in minimum volatility exposures. When you look at that bottom left table, I think what you take into account is you have a slight return improvement. A lot of that comes down to the fact that we've been in a volatile time period. Um, but you have a nice risk reduction, and you have that improvement in your sharp ratio. I think that's what's really important here when you, when you think about the minimum, vol minimum volatility solutions and how clients can be using them. Some of our clients, and I think um, one of our larger institutional clients, uses the minimum volatility solutions as a risk dial. 
So they'll evaluate their whole entire portfolio, and they'll look at it backward looking and see what the volatility has been. And then they'll take, well, what do I think is going to happen in the next few months, the next few years in terms of volatility? Um, for instance, this client actually uses the, the Acqui product, so ACWV, and they'll use it as a risk dial. So if they believe that volatility is going to pick up, they'll invest more in the minimum volatility solution. So you see that as a, as a blend of kind of a, as a uh, strategic as well as a tactical type investment. When we think about can this be a substitute for my core equity exposure, um, clients typically in the U.S. space are utilizing the USMV product is let's call it 25 to 50 percent of their core equity allocation. Uh, the more and more comfortable clients, um, and this goes for pension clients, retail clients, RAA clients, insurance clients, the more comfortable they get with this type of solution and how it behaves in different environments, you've actually seen that percent allocation tick up even greater than 50% where you see clients view this as a core equity exposure within their portfolio. Um, and that's inclusive of emerging markets. I think emerging markets, we've seen it more of a, as a supplement to let's call it EEM or VWO or DEM because of the volatility framework um, and because it's got some really nice performance numbers on, on the back end of it. So when we look at uh, this slide, we can view this as potentially as risk budgeting, another very key way that we've seen clients use this type of strategy. So we have that 60-40 portfolio. We're, add, we're able to add in 10% into emerging markets without necessarily changing the overall risk profile of that investment. Um, while emerging markets have had a really tough year, there's many clients that see, this, see emerging markets as a long-term growth opportunity. So we're having clients that are living longer. They need more growth from their equity portfolio. How can they do it, and how can they allocate to many different asset classes thoughtfully in terms of where they allocate that risk? And that's where we've seen great benefit of using an emerging market minimum volatility product. Last winter, we were working with a client, and, and the client came to us, and they wanted to invest in emerging market debt. Um, they really liked the diversification benefits from emerging market debt, and they also liked uh, the yield that emerging, debt, uh, emerging market debt was, was kicking off. When they modeled it into their portfolio, they weren't comfortable with the overall volatility that that was going to bring for the, the greater part of the portfolio. Working with them, they actually dialed down their broad emerging market equity exposure and used the minimum volatility solution in that space to feel comfortable making that allocation to emerging market debt but not changing the overall volatility of their greater portfolio. And then lastly, working with non-U.S. clients. Um, we have a, a number of non-U.S. clients looking at the minimum volatility products and using the minimum volatility products as market volatility is not something that we are experiencing here in the U.S. It's a global issue, and we've actually seen some New Zealand clients use this as a way to bring money off the sidelines. So they have a what's called a 3 to 4% cash rate, and they're looking at ways to get clients invested in equity. So they're starting to use the minimum volatility solutions as ways to leg into the market. So overall, I think we've seen great attraction bringing in close to $7 billion in assets to the iShares minimum volatility suite. Um, clients see a number of different ways and a number of different efficacies in the differences between our products and the competitive landscape as a way to access the market, do it thoughtfully, and provide much greater investment flexibility when making decisions to enter the equity markets. Uh, from there, I want to turn it over. I know we're going to have a number of questions, um, so I'll turn it over to Ollie for some questions. Thank you very much, uh, Todd, and uh, thank you, Raman. Uh, certainly very interesting. Uh, a lot of questions coming in from the audience, which is great. And uh, I want to start off, uh, kind of represent the, uh, the, the pattern of questions here. Clearly, coming into very sharp focus is uh, the 1,000-pound uh, gorilla in the room, your arch rival, uh, a fund put out by PowerShares. I think Raman made brief allusion to it, SPLV, based on S&P indexes. Uh, tell us how, let's say, USMV, the principal competitor with SPLV, how does that differ? And mm -hmm. more broadly, maybe this is a Raman question, uh, the index methodology. 
Uh, we'll take it from there. These questions get mighty granular, but I'm starting with the broad brush strokes. So, Todd, you want to take that one? Sure. I'll, I'll start off, and I'll, I know Raman did refer to it a few times, as, as did I. Um, so SPLV was the, the first product to launch in the space. So it, it launched, I believe, in May of 2011. Um, to Raman's point, the index launched the month before. So you can see that you know MSCI has a much longer track record in the minimum volatility space launching their indices live in 2008, so almost a three-year, four-year head start in terms of evaluating this space and truly trying to harvest that academic theory. Where we've seen clients compare the two and what they, the conclusion they come to is um, they'll use SPLV sometimes in tandem with USMV, but they'll use it much more as a tactical solution um, because it tends to be highly concentrated in utilities, I believe it holds 29 of the 31 stocks in the utility sector from the S&P 500, and it tends to be fairly concentrated in consumer staples. So you end up with about 60% of your allocation in two sectors, two sectors that don't make up that portion of the market. I believe utilities is only about a 3% allocation within the S&P 500. That's the major difference is that we're putting these plus or minus 5% bands, or MSCI is putting these plus or minus 5% bands, around sectors and countries. Um, you see this come to fruition as you know, a potential taper. How violently will clients move out of consumer staples and the expensive sector of utilities? While there may be lower volatility, how will that affect overall vol of the portfolio and then in turn the investor's experience? Um, the last component we tend to talk about when comparing the two is that you're solely looking at one year of standard deviation and you're backward looking on the S&P methodology. Um, while on the MSCI side, you're thinking about it from the portfolio level. So um, essentially, you could include a stock that may have a beta close to one, but if it's going to have negative or even low correlations to the rest of the securities in the portfolio, it's going to be an attractive addition as a constituent within the index and turn our product, driving volatility lower and allow for a more diversified solution, uh, eliminating some of that event risk that you get from those concentrations within sectors. Uh, Raman, was there anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I, th I think one more important aspect of the methodology is that we constrain the turnover. So, so if you look at many of these minimum volatility portfolios, uh, unconstrained portfolios, tend to have very high turnover. So if you look at the S&P methodology, uh, some of the numbers they have published on the website uh, show that for their rebalancing annual uh, reconstitution, when they do it, they do it like four times a year, but when you come to sum up all the turnovers together, in some years it is upward of 100% of turnover. Whereas, you know, MSCI put a 20% turnover constrained annual turnover. So some of the excess return that you can see potentially in the SPLV versus MSCI at a certain period of time, maybe it's maybe mostly a paper number rather than actual implementation number because the excess turnover can, can create a, a transaction cost which can eat into the, the, the potential alpha for these strategies within the SPLV product. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, there's a related question to distinguish between uh, these two securities, SPLV and, and USMV. Uh, Last month, there were substantial uh, uh, redemptions from USMV, I think about $1.4 billion nearly. And interestingly, SPLV actually gathered uh, assets. Trivial amount, but nonetheless in the positive. And uh, I'm wondering if you uh, might comment, uh, I presume this is a question for you, Todd, as to why that might be the case. Uh, clearly, it's not a uh, the bottom of falling out of the popularity of these strategies, but something is distinct, uh, it, it, perhaps the, the population of holders of these two securities? Yeah, and, you know, Ali, I think you alluded to this in, in an article a few weeks back, um, is the dichotomy of what makes up our product suite, and it tends to be a solid portion of retail investors as well as a really nice uh, portion of institutional investors, which can move heavy chunks of money, um, which can be, you know, hundreds of millions or even billions, um, you know, in one swath or within a, a few week time period. Um, in that case, we, we did on the U.S. side see some substantial redemptions. This was from institutional clients that were evaluating these products from an absolute return perspective. So a much more tactical user of this, this suite of products. They had a very great experience trading it. 
So they were able to see, you can see the symmetry of the liquidity here where you can get in and you can get out when you want to. What was nice is we were able to actually hold on to those assets as that client migrated into higher risk assets, so into Russell 2000 and S&P 500 style vehicles. Um, so again, just as you mentioned, yes, very institutional um, heavy users that were viewing this as a absolute return vehicle as opposed to a strategic long-term investment lowering risk and potentially providing similar return experience over longer periods of time. Thank you. Yeah, the, the part of your answer there really uh, uh, points very elegantly to a, uh, a number of questions that the audience is, answer, is asking this afternoon. Uh, in terms of asset, asset allocation, uh, Todd, you had talked about uh, the strategic versus the tactical approach, and there's a great deal of uh, curiosity about uh, how to conceptualize this. You're talking about uh, this client of yours who actually uh, stayed inside the BlackRock family and went to higher risk uh, uh, investment choices. Um, how should uh, this be looked at uh, beyond these these very uh, difficult and volatile years that we've just lived through? Uh, if you could speak to the strategic allocation, how is this strategy going to hold going forward? And there's some very specific ones we'll get to in a moment, particularly if you were thinking about segueing from EEM to uh, EEMV, how would that look? So uh, mm -hmm. there's a number of questions embedded in there, but take it away, Todd. Sure, sure. I think it's what it really comes down to is what type of experience, what type of exposure are you looking for, and what is your forward-looking view on the market? Um, you know, as alluded to through, throughout the presentation, you know, the BlackRock view is this is a strategic long-term investment. Um, you know, reality is clients are going to use it a number of different ways, but because the true belief and why MSCI launched the indices and why we're tracking them is there is this academic anomaly and then there is this anomaly in the investment community where you can lower risk or provide better risk-adjusted returns over longer periods of time with this type of strategy. Uh, I think because of the amount of volatility we've seen in the market, because of the strong performance, uh, we see clients that want to use this tactically. Um, Again, it's very hard to time volatility, but if you have a strong belief of, of that you can do that and you can do it accurately, um, this could be a viable solution as a tactical investment. Uh, when you turn it to the emerging markets allocation, a uh, very different story to an extent is yeah, if, okay, if, I can, if I could just interrupt really quickly. Yep. You're right. That, that, that number that you showed on that chart, I mean, it was, it was about 1,000 basis points uh, on that example, just shy of that, if I recall correctly. Speak to that uh, as you get into the uh, answering the, the, the earlier question, please. Sure, sure. So um, I think, you know, there's two questions really embedded there is why, you're, why does EMV seem to have a little bit different flavor than the other three products in terms of the amount of risk reduction and some of the performance characteristics? And I think that's a really fair question. Um, if you look at emerging markets, one, within the minimum volatility framework, uh, EEMV does not have the same amount of risk reduction as you see in the global, the developed markets, or the U.S. strategy, where you typically have a, a beta closer to 0 0.9, or excuse me, 0 0.8, and a risk reduction on average closer to 25% relative to what's called the U.S. market, where your beta is closer to you know, 0 0.6, 0 0.65, and a risk reduction north of 30% on average over longer periods of time. So being that's the case, you're able to capture a bit more of the upside, but you're also going to capture a bit more of the downside on average. Um, being that we're still uh, experiencing positive markets, maybe not in the emerging market solutions, um, this offers you that protection, but also offers that participation that clients want from emerging market solutions. For clients evaluating, well, do I use EEM? Do I use EEMV? Uh, you have to take into account, well, one, what do I like about EEM? Well, you're investing in the market. Um, you're getting that beta of one. When markets go on a tear, and maybe let's call it a, a junk rally, you're going to capture all of it. Um, you're going to go full beta. By going into the minimum volatility solution, you have to understand and you have to take into account the experiences that you're going to have and in turn your clients may have if you were to have another um, you know, double-digit year, like I alluded to, the 2009 year, where you lag by 20%. Um, while you're still up 60 for that year, you did lag by 20% in that market. So it's, it's taking into account when you evaluate these solutions is what do you really want out of it? Are, are, are you looking for outperformance? 
Are you looking for risk reduction? Are you looking for an alternative way to access the market um, but retain that integrity of the index, you know, just as on the sector side? Same things for the countries where EM Minval is not going to be 40% in South Africa and 20% in, or another 40% in Taiwan. It's going to be diversified across those countries that you think about when you think about emerging markets being, you know, the Chinas, the Brazils, the Russias, the Indias. You're going to have broad market exposure, but you're doing it in a much lower volatility framework. So, so to what extent are you able to generalize as far as, as, as one audience member has framed a question, you know, if you, if you have a good position in a uh, sizable position in EEM, and you might want to segue some of that to EEMV. You know, how do you how do you frame that question so that you arrive at the right answer? And then, you know, that's I'm sure that that's a, that, that could be answered in a number of ways, given that different investors have different risk appetites, different ages, the, the whole gamut of, of of caveats. But how do you approach it in a general sense? Yeah, from a general sense, um, you know, I think the first question you want to ask the client or you ask the investor is, what is your view for the next? You know, for your, say, what's your holding period? So maybe your holding period is the next three years. Um, what, what is your view on volatility for the next three years? What is the experience? What is your view on what's going to happen? Um, and so potentially you, maybe you think we've hit the bottom in emerging markets and we're going for a run. If you believe that we're going to go for a run with a low amount of volatility, uh, you're, you're probably better suited from an absolute return perspective to be in an EEM. Um, if you're unsure, but you believe there's going to be a significant amount of volatility, you can see these nicely as a pair, as a pair between VWO and EEMV or even the EEM and EEMV. Um, or if you want to increase your allocation broadly to emerging markets, you can increase your allocation using EEMV and not necessarily change your overall vol of that portfolio, still allowing you to capture that upswing in emerging markets if we have hit the bottom. Um, but also have that, that protection if that's not the case. So very client dependent, but we have seen clients migrate from EEM. We have seen clients migrate from VWO into EEMV and as well as um, some of the other emerging markets products that we offer here at iShares. That's great. And now, then, uh, I'm sorry, Raman, you were going to chime in there? Yeah I, yeah, I just wanted to add to, uh, so in the institutional space, what we have seen is that um, some of my clients who are going for the first time into emerging market space and they were a little bit worried about the, uh, the excess volatility, have taken the Minval route as a, as a first um, allocation into the emerging market. So they opted to go into the MSCI Minval um, uh, emerging market products instead of directly going to the emerging market. Uh, so the allocation is through that particular route. Okay, great. Now, one, one of the uh, – uh, there are several questions that are, that are touching on, on, on the following theme. Uh, and they seem to be, in a general sense, all about is too much of a good thing uh, no longer a good thing, which is to say uh, there's clear interest in this subject. Uh, this webinar is pretty well attended. Uh, and that said, there's this undercurrent of uh, whether these products will continue to provide alpha in addition to risk reduction over time, or is that alpha going to be arbed away as more products come to market? Uh, this, this question has also been framed in terms of PE. Um, are the MinVol indices overpriced? Are the PE ratios higher? Um, this is, a, I think, a question probably for Raman, but I'm sure, Todd, you might have something to say uh, about it as well. Raman, do you, do you want to take a crack at that, please? Yeah, I can, I can look at So, so uh, on the, specifically on the PE questions, if you look at the MinVol PE, and I'm looking at the forward PEs rather than the backward, you know, the uh, trailing PEs, MinVol is uh, roughly today about, for the U.S. MinVol, you're talking about a PE of close to 16.4 or so. This is the forward PE. And when you look at the, the U.S. PE, the MSCI USA PE is close to about 14.6 or 15. So there's not much of a valuation difference. You know, there is definitely a little bit of uh, uh, price differential, but it is not super expensive compared to the, the core beta because ultimately we are still capturing the majority of the beta of the underlying market. It's only that we are restricting the stock uh, to the stocks which have lower volatility. So, so in the other aspect is whether it will be arbitraged away. Now, the way we have seen is that um, there are multiple risk premia which exist in the market, and each of the risk premia have its own uh, pattern of performance. And when you look at the min wall as a strategy, they tend to do better whenever there is a, a excess uh, risk in the market. When market perceives there is going to be risk, is going to increase. When the VIX goes up, you have seen min wall like strategies do better. 
And in normal markets, they tend to do similar to the underlying benchmark. And when there is a huge beta rally, uh, like you know the tech rally, which we saw in late 90s, a min wall like strategy is going to perform. So, so uh, there is a, a pattern of the performance. So one thing which we have seen is that many of the institution will always blend uh, a, a, a not a single risk premium. They will multi, uh, they will uh, go. Uh, Include include other risk other risk premium strategies. Uh, um, so MSCI has indices on them. So so we have a, a value weighted strategy. We have quality strategies, and 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 uh, and and iShares have launched products on them. So so if 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 a investor is looking for a more diversified risk premium strategies, uh, including MSCI, the main wall is a strategy. There are products and 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 indices available for investors. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, there's also some more granular questions about asset uh, about allocation in particular uh, some of these ind indexes. Uh, specifically, uh, let, let's look at the, um, the ACWI uh, minimum volatility fund. Uh, how has that country allocation uh, changed over in, in recent years? Uh, the U.S. has the most exposure, I think it's 47. And how has that exposure changed over the years? So let me take that. So, so in terms of the, what you've seen is that the, the way the index is constructed, you will still get the uh, because we are controlling, uh, controlling the the overweight and underweight. Uh, we put this plus or minus five percent band around the country exposure. You'll find that as the countries have become more risky, the stocks in particular countries have become riskier. So they will be underweighted related to parent benchmark. So, for example, if China is 5% in, in the index and if the risk of the China goes uh, goes up, potentially they will be underweighted related to their exposure in the in the parent benchmark. But it's it's not going to, it's not going to happen that you're going to completely eliminate one country or you're going to just focus on one particular company country. So, so over the period of time, as countries have changed and as securities from the countries have become more uh, more riskier, definitely the country weight will fluctuate. But because we put this constraint of plus or minus five percent around the country, uh, the weight in the benchmark, you will not find that you will have a suddenly one only one country dominating the benchmark. Okay, fair enough. Now there is a, a, a number of questions that are coming in here. Uh, in a general sense, a lot of people are curious to to know what the academic research is showing in terms of going farther back in time. To what extent are you able to comment on these trends? that you're pointing out uh, as they have existed uh, further back in time beyond the time frame that you uh, focused on in this webinar, which was largely around the time of the, uh, the crisis and, and, and the aftermath. Sure. Uh, I can touch on that just you know, briefly. Uh, this is Todd again. Um, going back, I mean, you can Google you know, the low beta anomaly, and you're going to get, you know, 40 or different papers, all with research going very far back. Um, internally here, we, we've done some research, and we have a market perspective out that actually shows this anomaly going back to from 1929 into 2011 in the U.S. market. And if you were to evaluate that time period, uh, very similar results where over that time period, you have about a half a percent um, on an annualized basis of increase in return. Um, you do have around that 30% reduction in risk, and you had about a 40% increase in your Sharpe ratio, and that's, a, you know, an 80-plus year period. And that's very same approach um, using a risk model and evaluating that's just on the U.S. market. So and if you were to look at a number of those different papers that uh, you can find on, on the web from, you know, active providers, financial analysts, journals, uh, you see the, the very similar approach where they, they go back some to the 60s, some to the 70s. Uh, and as we alluded, there are time periods where you'd have to anticipate that underperformance. Um, and our research showed the 50s, so post-World War II, where markets went on a tear. Uh, you did have some underperformance. And then, you know, um, more recently in, in the late 90s and the, in the mid part of the, the 2000s where you did leave some money on the table, but I think over that longer period of time, you still were able to produce alpha and harvest this low beta anomaly. So, uh, so it's a mega, mega bull markets is what you're talking about. That's when this is going to underperform. That, that's another uh, strain of questions we've, we've seen here this afternoon. Uh, that 50s, 90s, these are, these are real just unequivocally bullish markets, and that's when you see underperformance here? Yep, and it, it's a bullish market, but it's a bullish market that tends to have uh, a low amount of volatility. So, um, you know, in a short time period, you may underperform in a junk rally, but a junk rally is typically followed by a good amount of volatility. Um, so if you isolate that market, you actually end up doing pretty well there, too. Okay, perfect. Well, 
that you know that's about the the time we have. Uh, let's uh, let's call it a day. That concludes our expert series webinar on men vault for the long haul. A uh, bit of housekeeping. I think I neglected to say earlier that uh, this presentation will be available to all of you 24 to 48 hours following today's webinar. You'll get email instructions as to how to access that. On that note, uh, Raman and Todd, I want to thank you for being my guests. And I also want to thank the audience for attending and for some really good questions. On that note, on behalf of Raman and Todd, my guests from MSCI and iShares, and all my colleagues here at Index Universe, I'm Ollie Ludwig, wishing you all a very pleasant afternoon.